Well, after living in Manhattan Beach for 32 years, it's great to know that you know my first name, Andy Cohen, Andy, not Portia Cohen's husband. So I'm really thrilled to be here. I thought I'd start off with a question first for the audience. Which sector represents the largest carbon footprint in, out there on the world right now? The largest carbon footprint. Is it automobiles? What's that? No, let me finish. Automobiles, industry, or buildings? Most people say industry, so you're a very smart audience. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is discussing built mega trends in around the globe in industry and sustainable design. And there's a tremendous change going on right now around the globe. In fact, for the first whoop, can you go back one? For the first time in human history, more people live in cities than do not. And this is an incredible mega trend, and I'm going to talk a lot about that over the next 20 minutes. And for the first time in human history, more people have uh, water scarcity in their lifetime. And for the first time in human history, people have to decide whether to grow food or grow fuel. And for the first time in human history, we are beyond peak oil. And for the first time in human history, and you've heard all about this, these are the six hottest years ever in a single decade. And no, I am not Al Gore, and I'm not going to be talking like Al Gore today. I'm going to be talking about buildings and the, and the influence of buildings in the built environment on our lives. In fact, as I started, the three sectors, buildings are increasing exponentially more than transportation or industry. In fact, industry sort of flattened out over the last uh, 20 years, and buildings have increased incredibly. And that's what we're here to talk about today is sustainable design and impact on humans. Another statistic a lot of people don't know is that 72% of all electricity is buildings, 40% is primary utilization, and almost 14% is portable water consumption. So this incredible growth that's going on around the globe, I'm going to talk about this growth and how we deal with the impact of this growth. In fact, and you've seen this hockey, puck, hockey stick diagram, over the, since 1850 to 2007, it's increased 30-fold, and over the next 23 years, it's, it's stated it's going to grow by 60%. And the, the solution has to be a global solution. It's not a local solution, it's a global solution. For in fact, if you look at these statistics on demographics, you could see the incredible size of China and India and some of the other countries. And in 2050, you're going to start seeing emerging economies become even larger and gobble up more and more energy. And of course, you could see India even outpacing China in growth and size. And here you can see this emerging, the emerging country's GDP, where you see for a long time, developing countries had the largest GDP. And now we're transferring this. This is a moment in time in all of our lifetimes where the emerging economies are now larger, larger than the developing countries. In fact, in China, incredible statistic, 20 billion square feet were built last year. 20 billion. In the US, there was 3 billion square feet built last year. So you can see the profound impact that China alone, let alone talk about India, that China has on us. 15 million people in China moved to cities, from the farms to the cities for jobs. So this increased urbanization, this, this mega city approach, and how we deal with sustainability abroad and in the U.S. is going to be critical. In fact, if you look at the 10 largest cities in China, eight of them are larger than L.A. And in fact, Shanghai is twice the size of Los Angeles. So is it a global solution? Of course it's a global solution. We are working right now on a vertical city in Shanghai. This is the second tallest building in the world. Different than the building that was built in the middle of the desert in Dubai, this building is a living city, a sustainable city. It ha it's a new regional benchmark. China wants to put a stake in the sand to say that they are going to be a sustainable country. It has a bioclimatic design, and I'll talk about the intelligent skin of this building. It has integrated water and waste management. It has low energy and low carbon filtration. It's built out of total sustainable materials. In fact, the top of the building has wind turbines in it that will generate all the energy and all the electrical needs for the building. The building is specifically designed so that it would be self-sustaining from an electrical capacity standpoint. And in fact, what that means is 
we will save per year two, two times the size of Central Park in, in foresting or in water utilization to give you a, can you go back one? It's five times the si size of the Silver Lake Reservoir in wa water conservation. I mean, there's a mega scale, and this is only one building, the largest building in China, the second largest building in the world, but you can see the impact that this has. As I mentioned, at the top of the building, these wind turbines will provide the energy for the building, and I'll talk a lot later about how energy needs to be given back to the grid instead of buildings taking built energy from the grid, giving energy back to the grid. So the building skin, and you're going to hear a lot about this throughout the United States soon, the building skin is an intelligent skin. There are two layers to the outside of the building that let light in during the winter and block the light during the, during the summer. It's, a, it's an intelligent skin because it has photovoltaics built into it. Here you can see those two layers of skins and these mini atriums, these mini uh, landscaped atriums that are self-sufficient. And we use the shape of the building. You're going to start to see in architecture the shape of the building as trying to save energy, too. In this case, because it's a round building and we shaped it a certain way, it allowed us to save 24% of the amount of steel that went into the building itself and also allowed for the wind turbines at the top of the building. So the example here is, and this is uh, the example of this global sustainability, the Chinese government's putting this building up as the example of the future of China that every building going forward needs to relate to these kind of sustainability standards. But how does it relate to us here? And this is an incredible statistic, that 25% of the polluting matter on air on some days right here comes from Asia, comes from China, comes from the dust storms and polluting from cars that are coming into our environment. So it truly is a global issue. This is a shot from space of the U.S. and the amount of light being met, emitted from all the major cities in the U.S. In fact, now I'm going to go into what the LEED certification and LEED energy cert certification in the U.S. Green building, the green building design emits 40% less energy. That's how important it is to our environment. And as a lot of you know, the U.S. Green Building Council started a group about 10 years ago for leadership in energy and environmental design. And most buildings now that are building in the U.S. now are going under these standards. So what do green buildings do? They reduce energy by, as I said, somewhere between 24 and 50 percent. CO2 emissions, close to 40 percent. Water utilization, 40 percent. And solid waste, 70 percent. But as important, it's about the human. And Kay just said that. It's all about the human beings. And Linda Reinstein talked about that this morning, about asbestos in buildings. In schools, 20% better test performance in a LEED certified building, 20%. In hospitals, two and a half days earlier discharge. Why? Because the air is healthier. There's more air, air changes per hour. The, built, the, the actual materials in hospitals are not giving off gassing and infiltrating patients' lungs. In retail, and this is, this is definitely being documented, in retail stores, sustainability increases sales per square foot. In factories, increasing production. And finally, in offices, and we're doing a lot of studies on this right now, it increases pr productivity. How? Because people aren't going to be absent from work because of building sickness syndrome. Indeed, even today, as I was sitting here, we hermetically closed up this room and we turned the air conditioner on. We're two blocks away from the ocean. We have to be smarter with our energy utilization everywhere we are in, in every community. And this whole discussion around uh, cost, and there seems to be a pushback, especially now in this economy, around the cost of sustainability. In fact, green buildings are somewhere between 1% and 5% for all green buildings that are being done. And the payback continues to decrease year over year. What's being done about this right now on the policy level? Well, in California, in 2011, January 1, 2011, there'll be a new standards across California in green building standards. And all existing state-owned facilities will be LEED Silver, the very high level of standard for all public buildings. In Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles now is offering expedited plan check for any LEED certified building. And right now, it's so important from a schedule standpoint for developers to get through the process quicker. 
now there's an incentive to get through the process quicker with certification. We just finished this 60-story building in downtown Los Angeles uh, hotel right next to uh, LA Live. And this building is LEED Gold. And the building was shaped, as I discussed before, for energy efficiency. We're just uh, breaking ground in the next month on a building at the Port of Long Beach. This building is LEED Platinum. It's the highest possible level in LEED sustainability. The building will have on its skin photovoltaics, and it will also incorporate the latest state of the art in every part of uh, the picking of building products. And in fact, what we did is we positioned the building in a way so that we can take advantage of the winds in Long Beach. And so there are windmill, wind turbines built into the side of the building, which will again, in Shanghai you saw at the top of the building, here we're incorporating at the edge of the building. And through some very sophisticated photometrics, we're able to study the positioning of the building to maximize the airflow, the wind flow around the building, therefore driving more energy and using less energy from the building itself. And you could see the red, where the red line is there is where we place the windmills strategically. And in Nevada, and this was a real breakthrough for Nevada, and think about it, most of Nevada is a big desert. Well, in Nevada, they instituted this idea that you get 25% rebate for a silver sustainable building, 30% for a gold, and 35% for a platinum building. And this became, five years ago, a wave that ran through all of Nevada that instituted sustainability in most buildings that were being built. So we just completed the lar world's largest sustainable project in Vegas. Isn't that odd that the largest sustainable project in the world is in the middle of the desert? Why? Because water is a scarcity. So we worked hard to try to make sure that the, the buildings itself conserve water from a maximum standpoint. So this project is a huge project, 20, 18 million square feet, $10 billion, represented the MGM corporate policy of being a sustainable organization. So around the world, when you touch MGM, you'll be touching a sustainable organization in everything they do and everything they touch. Here you can see the site, uh, which is basically a city within a city, 20 million square feet all built at one time, a city within a city using every lead sustainable strategy uh, utilized in the project. And I hope you all visit that project because it's a great example. So what about this project? Because it always comes up over and over again. I used the, the quote, $10 billion. Well, because of the tax incentives and because of other, the energy savings on water and energy, there was an added 5% cost. So you could see the 5% is a lot of money on a $10 billion project. Well, there was a 30% energy savings from LEED, LEED Gold, and the payback for MGM is three years on $10 billion. So why not do it? Why can't we do small projects and large projects to be able to do it? So what did it save? It saved 33% in portable water use. It saved 60% in the use of water in the landscaping. All of the products within city center are sustainable, and they use stewardship for council and certified forestry. And a really important point of this is they demoed a lot of buildings that were there. All 94% of the building products that were demoed were used, reused again in other buildings. And in Manhattan Beach, driving it right here to Manhattan Beach, and yes, I know the city councilwoman very well. <laughs> Large commercial buildings, over 10,000 square feet, LEED silver equivalent. In Manhattan Beach, civic buildings will be LEED gold certified, and for solar and photaic panels, the fee is completely waived to incentivize people to use certification and energy efficiency design. So I get asked this question a lot, which is, so how are we doing? How are we doing as a nation? And you could see California is by far the leader in LEED certified buildings. And over the next five years, we'll exponentially grow. Uh, and it's, I'm really proud to say that we are the leaders right here in California. It's a great testimony to all the, and I know there are several architects in the room, lead certification and certification to the U.S. Building, Green Building Council. So what's happening and what's the future? And I'll close on this. So the future is, is right now, certification in 2009 is still taking energy from the grid. Even though it's sustainable, it's still utilizing energy and it's still taking energy. 
Buildings of the future will be giving energy back to the grid. They'll be so energy efficient that, and you'll be able to use energy in a certain way that at night you'll be able to give energy back to the grid, therefore sa not only saving energy, but creating energy, self-sustaining itself. So if I close on this, there are three key issues that I, that I was talking about today. One is the profound economic drivers of reducing annual energy costs and operating and maintenance costs, of increasing productivity and reducing absentism, of improving financial performance of corporations, of environmental, conserving limited resources, reducing pollution, and preserving na native habitats. And finally, the social one, so important, the human one, about improving occupant health and human performance. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.